Okay, so let's start with prayer. Uh, always a good way to begin. Heavenly Father, tonight our meeting is kind of weird. We're doing this online, and yet, I guess for the last eight months, it's not weird. This is this is what we've been doing a lot. It's not the same. It's not as good as being together, but we do thank you for it. We thank you that we can still learn and grow even when we have to be a little bit separated because of illness. We pray for our county, our state, our nation, and our world that you would uh, bring vaccination quickly, as soon as possible, that you would bless economies and leaders. We especially pray that the church around the world would do a really good job of sharing the hope we have in Jesus in the midst of some pretty difficult circumstances. And to that end, then we ask you that you bless our class together tonight, that we would learn from your word and would begin to understand more deeply the, the great gifts you give to us and, and help us to live from their strength in daily life. In the name of Jesus, our crucified risen Savior, we pray. Amen. Okay, so this is where we stopped off last time. And uh, this is being recorded, so when we get done tonight, I'll put it up online, and uh, if you miss something, want to go back, or of course, for the people who aren't able to make it tonight, uh, people I'm still keeping my eye out for, they'll be able to do that as well. So we ended on this slide that talked about how there are differences in the church depending on how churches treat the Bible. And what can be very helpful is kind of, there's a little uh, chart here that uh, will show that a little bit. And again, if I go too fast, um, just holler at me, okay? And it's okay to give feedback because I can't see you now. So if I if I hear you, I know you're still there and you're not watching the football game, right? Yes? How dare you? Okay. <laughs> All right, good. There's still people here. All right. Uh, so we're going to take a look now at it's kind of three main branches of Christianity. And we'll start over on the what's called liberal churches. And that's a label, you know, you have conservative and liberal, but basically it's churches that are moving away from uh, what you would call basically a simple or common understanding of the Bible. And they're moving more towards um, interpreting according to reason as our text says. So in other words, if this makes sense to me, I'll believe it. But if it doesn't make sense to me, then yeah, it couldn't have happened. So let's take a look at some examples there. They use a, a, a Bible study interpretation method called the historical critical method. Now, that may not mean a lot to you, but, but here's what it's kind of about. They look back at, at the history of the book. So let's, uh, the Old Testament is pretty famous for this. So they'll look at, for example, uh, the, the book of Genesis. That's an easy one to, to use because it's the first book of the Bible. And they'll look at that and they'll say, well, you know, that was written a long time ago in history when, when people didn't understand what we understand today. And, and then they pull it apart, they analyze it. And of course, you have to be a super smart professor kind of a person to get this, right? Uh, and so they've looked in the book of Genesis, for example, and when uh, one name for God is used, they'll say, well, that's obviously one author but over here, we have a different name for God or a different title for God used. That must be a different author. And then later, some editor kind of hodgepodge the whole thing together. And, and you can imagine how that would cause all kinds of problems in biblical interpretation, because you're basically saying, I'm going to interpret the book um, based on what I think makes sense to me. Uh, and so you have some really, really bad things that, that come out of that. Uh, for example, the Bible is treated as a human book with mistakes. Uh, probably one of the best examples of this, uh, well, let me give you some, some individual examples. So individual example could be Jonah was in a fish or maybe a whale. The Hebrew word can mean either, by the way. For three days, no, that could never happen. So obviously, it's an embellishment. It's not a, an accurate account of the, of the Bible. It's just a made-up story to somehow draw attention to some biblical teaching. Or another one would be Jesus walked on water. You know, that could never happen. So we're going to definitely say it didn't happen. Uh, what else do I have here? Uh, the virgin birth. There's no way that could happen. How about, happen. How about you know, that could never happen that either. Um, by the way, if you mute your microphone while I'm talking, then you won't get the feedback. But 
unmute yourself when you need to talk, okay? Um, so all of these things are good examples, you know, single examples of how, you know, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I, I heard, uh, I read an article actually about a guy in, in Florida, some quote unquote Bible professor who wasn't much of a Bible professor. And he said, you know, I think I figured that walking on water thing out that in, in Galilee, you get a strong north wind that can be very cold. And what happened is the northern part of the lake froze but where the disciples were in their boat on the southern part of the lake. It hadn't frozen yet. And so they saw Jesus walking on ice. And so that's kind of the example of what you see. Uh, the funny thing about that is they forget the part where Peter walks on the water to go see Jesus, but, you know, never mind that. And, and so this has been a, a very popular method of Bible study. I, I won't call it Bible study of looking at the Bible as, as a literary work for about 250 years. It started in Europe in the 1700s uh, and especially in the 1800s. It grew. It moved to the United States in the 1900s. And that's why we are where we are today, where you can turn on a PBS special and someone will very confidently say, well, we all know that, of course, that no one could rise from the dead. But why, why was that teaching uh, spread out in the early Christian church? And, and they'll just approach it as fact. And, and then uh, an example I, I was going to share with you a little earlier was there is a group of so-called Bible scholars, and they put together a project called the Jesus Seminar. And they, they took the Gospels. So I got my Bible down here. And my Bible has, uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, wherever Jesus speaks, it, it's got the, the lettering in red. So it's called the Red Letter Bible for the Gospels. And they color-coded all the Gospels. And so blue means, uh, or red means, yeah, Jesus said that. Pink means, yeah, he probably said that. Green, they color-coded anything that Jesus said that he, he probably didn't. And blue, we're very sure he never said it. Now, you can guess which were the items that they were convinced Jesus never said. Anything that had to do with him saying like, I and the Father are one, or before Abraham was born, I am, or Jesus clearly makes an allusion to himself um, as God. So anything like that was pushed aside, said, no, 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 he would have never said that. But then very generic things like love one another, oh, yes, of course, Jesus said that. Uh, and so you can see with this kind of biblical interpretation there's no historical foundation, and the Bible can just be cut apart with scissors, uh, and, and we see a lot of that today. So any, any comments or questions or thoughts about that before I go to the next column? All right, then. And if you do think of something, um, you know, again, just unmute yourself and, and pop on in. Now, Roman Catholicism, they have a triangle kind of of three different sources of teaching. Uh, and so where, and we'll get the biblical Christianity, and that's what Lutheranism strives to be. We say we have one source of teaching, it's the Bible. Catholicism, Roman Catholicism says that, yes, the Bible, we get teaching from there, but also our sacred tradition, and that's not any tradition in Catholicism. There's a, there's a body of teaching they call tradition. It's, it's not just anything. But that tradition is just as valid as if it were in the Bible, as are the Pope and certain councils. And so you can get a teaching from any one of those three uh, teaching sources, and they're all considered to be equally valid. And so if it's in the Bible, yeah, we believe that, that that's taught. But if the Pope says it and it's not in the Bible, it's still just as authoritative. And uh, there's a couple places where the Pope has spoken with they use a Latin term called ex cathedra. It means from the chair. And they say when the Pope speaks from that chair, it's as if God himself were talking and it's beyond debate. Now, they've only done that twice because I think they realize how risky that is. But the two times they've done it, they have focused on uh, teachings about Mary, that she was sinless. Um, and that's why Jesus was born uh, without sin. And secondly, that she was I believe the other one is that she was bodily assumed into heaven, that she never died. And, and when you read the Bible, you find actually that the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible, uh, in Mary's song or speech that she gives to Elizabeth, she says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And so Mary herself recognized that she needed a Savior. So you got to be very careful with tradition and counsels. Tradition can be a good thing but only if it agrees with uh, and conforms to the Bible. 
And so that is why out of this tradition, you get things like a purgatory, a place where you your spirit goes after death, but you have to suffer for your sins. And yet the Bible says, and Christ died for sins once for all to bring you to God. So you have three sources in Ro Roman Catholicism. Uh, and so popes and councils can declare truth for the church without the Bible. You get stuff like purgatory. Uh, you get things like priests can't marry. That's not taught in the Bible. In fact, uh, they claim Peter as the first pope. And we know that Peter was married. The Bible talks about his mother-in-law. You get indulgences. Indulgences were uh, pieces of paper, certificates, if you will. And these were quite popular in the years right before the Reformation. It's one of the things that made Martin Luther go crazy. And if you needed to know for sure that your sins were forgiven, you could buy one of these certificates for a certain amount of money, and it would be signed by a church leader, like a bishop or something like that, and would declare that because you had given this gift, your sins were forgiven. You know, that's ridiculous. It says in the Bible your sins are forgiven because Jesus paid the price. But if you have other sources of teaching besides the Bible, you can get stuff like that. The Immaculate Conception, there it is, that Mary was without sin. That's, that's what that's about. And, and the bodily assumption of Mary, which, which I mentioned. Okay? Any questions, comments, thoughts about so, uh, Roman Catholic sources of teaching before I go on to the last column? Okay. Next column it is. Now, in biblical Christianity, and this is what we try to do, is that the Bible interprets the Bible. Uh, we don't have our pastors say things that, that are just as authoritative as the Bible. We don't believe that. And we try really hard to let the Bible interpret the Bible. This is a, a statement that came out of the Reformation. And so here I've got my Bible. I'll lift it up a little higher so you can see it. So if I'm looking in my, in my Bible, in fact, I happen to be turned here to the, the Lord's Supper. We may have time to get to the Lord's Supper tonight, although I, I doubt we will, but we might. So if I want to learn about the Lord's Supper, and there's a verse here, I'm not quite sure what it might say. Well, then I'm going to look in the Bible for all the other passages that talk about the Lord's Supper. And there's quite a few of them. And that helps the, me to understand because the Bible will give more information. The Bible will interpret the Bible. And that's a very helpful tool. Uh, and so uh, I was taught long ago when I was at the seminary, when I was writing a sermon, my professors said, don't go right to a commentary, some other scholar. You have to study the text yourself and study it thoroughly. And then and only then can you get a book written by some human as, as good a teacher as that person might be. And I think that's very good advice. Uh, we believe that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. We looked at that some time ago. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 is a great verse. It says that all scripture is God breathed. He breathed it out. And so because God said it, it's, it's not going to have errors in it. We do not say more than or less than what the Bible says. And I think we talked about this last time we were together. Uh, there, are, um, there are some things that the Bible doesn't say, and so we don't make stuff up. And there are some things that the Bible does say, and, and we can't avoid that. Uh, I talked about hell just a little bit um, in the sermon on Sunday, you know, and nobody likes to talk about hell. But the Bible does. Jesus does. And so we have to talk about that. And so we don't say more or less than what the Bible says. Oops. Okay. Let me back up there. I'm recording it in uh, Zoom so I can actually back up a little bit, which is nice. Okay. So that helps us understand kind of why when you go to one church, you hear one thing and you go to another church and you hear another. So at our church, we're, we are going to say and teach that the Bible is inspired by God. And it's without errors. You go to another church in our county or in a different state, and you might hear something very different. And a great way to, to investigate that is, then is to say, okay, where is this pastor? Where is this church? Where is this denomination getting their teaching? What is the source of their teachings? And that's very helpful. Uh, Mormonism, for example, claims to teach from the Bible, but they actually have four holy books that they use. And they'll say that the Bible is God's word insofar as it is, as it is correctly interpreted by the Book of Mormon. So again, you can look at a, a religion, a, a denomination, a, a congregation, and ask where do they get their teaching from? And it's very, very helpful. And that's why denominations aren't all bad, because uh, I, I probably used this with you guys before, but 
when you go to the grocery store and you want to get some soup and you and you go and you can see all the cans of soup and they have labels on them, right? This is chicken noodle, this is split pea and so on. If, if there were no labels on those cans, you wouldn't know if you're getting chicken noodle in one hand and it could be a can of Alpo in the other. And it makes a big difference when it's time for lunch, doesn't it? And, and so labels can be very helpful when you go to a, uh, our denomination is called the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. You're going to get a denomination that says, yep, the Bible is inspired. It doesn't have mistakes. You're, you're going to get that baptism and the Lord's Supper are ways where God works among his people. And you'll get that at pretty much every Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregation. You go to a Roman Catholic Church and you'll get something different. You're going to hear about purgatory. You, you might hear about Mary. Um, and, and why? Because there's different sources of teachings. Okay, does that make sense? Wait, I have to see. Does that make sense? You, you can nod your head and I can see. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. I have one. I just have one screen and I'm watching me. And it's a horrible thing. So I have to see you guys once in a while. All right. Well, let's go on then. Uh, so anytime a church says more or less than the Bible says, then you'll have differences. And uh, that's going to be a problem. I think now, let me try this. I think I can click on scripture verses and get them on the screen. Yay. Okay. So uh, in Revelation 22, this is the last book of the Bible, and uh, the Apostle John writes about Revelation, and he says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So it's kind of a, a serious thing, isn't it? Uh, also in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, and I believe in the book of Joshua, you get statements like that. So for the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the Israelites were told, don't add anything to this and don't take anything away. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Okay, so this little cartoon here, uh, you get uh, the Bible saying, uh, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But then some other guy, he's got his little uh, graduate's hat on thinking he's real smart. He says, no, I, I think, uh, and he then gives his opinion. My, my vicar supervisor had a great way of saying that. He said there's, there's three main groups in the church. One group says, uh, this is what I think. Another group would say, this is how I feel. And a third group, and he said, sadly, sometimes this is the smallest group. They would say, well, let's see what the Bible says. And I want to encourage you guys to be people who say, well, let's see what the Bible says. Because God is never going to steer you wrong. Letter B, we are told to hold firmly to the word, not change it, so that it makes better sense to us. So the word there is change. You can fill in your books there. Uh, and Titus 1.9, talking about what pastors should do, a pastor must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Uh, I did a I did a study on this this word sound doctrine some years ago and um, the word that's that's translated sound means healthy and so it's used in legal language in our day and age where someone might write a will and say I Alan some are being of sound mind and body in other words my mind and my body are healthy enough I know what I'm doing and so when you read this phrase sound doctrine in the Bible it's not just about getting it right you know we have the right answers but it's about being healthy. We want to encourage others by healthy doctrine. And, and this, is why, this is why God wants us to keep the Bible straight and, and teach what's in the Bible and not contradict it. It's not because he's some egotistical maniac who, who wants us all to do the right thing. It's because when we have the healthy stuff, then we'll be healthy. It's just like all you moms out there, and dads, well, dads, we aren't usually so good at this, but all you moms out there, you want your kids to eat healthy, right? Uh, and, and so you want them, yeah, you got to have some veggies, you know, got to have some fruit, you got to do all that stuff. Why is that? You want them to have sound or healthy food so their bodies are sound or healthy. And that's why God says, hey, don't, don't mess with my word. It's so that we will be healthy. Okay, I'm going to move on unless you start talking, because I can't see you. Uh, no, Roman numeral four, the church has a public ministry. This word public comes from a Latin word. And, and it means on behalf of. In other words, public ministry for pastors doesn't mean that we're always up front. Uh, sometimes we're doing something very 
um, very hidden from, from public viewing. Uh, for example, just last week, I visited a, a couple that's in a care facility. I was still able to go and do that then, thank the Lord. Um, but nobody saw me. I mean, I, I drove down there. I had to drive a ways. I walked into the care facility. You know, had the mask and washed the hands and all that stuff. And then I was in a large room sitting a distance away from this couple. But they're not able to get out anymore. They're not able to go to church. And I, I was able to visit them. That wasn't public in the sense of being in front of everybody. But it was public in the old sense of being done on behalf of the congregation. Uh, Pastor Kyle and I are so blessed because we have a congregation that supports us and gives us a salary so we can do this stuff. And we can go visit people and encourage them with the gospel and take communion into homes and those sorts of things. And, and so uh, as I share with you some Bible verses here for the next few minutes, please know that I, I don't do this to kind of toot my own horn or draw attention to me or Pastor Kyle. Is just to give you what the Bible says about the pastoral office. Uh, by faith, all Christians are royal priests before God and are called to declare his praises. So let me uh, pop this verse on. So I'm going to let you write down the word priests. I know I go fast. I'm trying to be calm. Deep breath. Deep breath. <laughs> so when we look at 1 Peter 2, verse 9, Peter says, and this is a y'all, but y'all are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. All right, so I got, I got to get some interaction here. It's hard for me to teach without interaction. So let me pop you guys up on the screen. So uh, if you look at the Old Testament, what, do, what were the two main jobs or maybe categories of jobs that you think Old Testament priests did? Think of Aaron. He was the first high priest. And and, you know, there, were, there was the tabernacle and all this stuff. What do you think were the two main categories of things that, uh, that priests did? Hi, Ruth. So what would you say that priests did? Atonement. Okay, atonement. And how did they make atonement? Sacrificing animals. Right, exactly, right. So, so if I was your high priest in the Old Testament, I, oh, it's another dog. Uh, I would, uh, I would uh, go on your behalf. I would go to the altar at the tabernacle, and I would sacrifice an animal. Let's see. Okay. So here's our sacrificial beast. Okay, got that? My little plastic pit bull, right? Okay. He also moves. It's intimidating, isn't it? Be intimidating. Okay. So here's the sacrificial. So I would go to the altar and I would sacrifice that for you on the altar. You can't do that because you're not a priest. So that was, you're right, Sue. That was the number one main thing was to offer sacrifices to God for the people who could not do that. And the, uh, the other function would be then facing the other direction. So what did the priest do to and for the people? What do you think? Pray for them. Okay, but that would be to God. So, so what do I do? What does Pastor Kyle do when we face you guys? Bless you. You preach to us? Yes. So it's right. So it's the whole preaching, teaching thing. And you could read in the Bible, Aaron instructed the people. Uh, there's a priest named Ezra later in the Old Testament. Yeah. So those are the two main functions. Offer sacrifices and then teach the people. Now, we know the Bible clearly says that Jesus is our great high priest. And so we don't need to have priests offering sacrifices anymore because Jesus offered the final sacrifice. And yet, if you look at the Bible verse on the screen, it says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And so if we don't need priests anymore to God, hmm, and you're all priests, what are you going to do? You're going to do exactly those same two functions. I see a car driving around. I want to make sure it's not Laura Lee. I'm going to sit next to you. Huh. Okay, well, let me finish this bit, and then I'll, I'll look out the window or out the door. So as priests, you're going to go to God on behalf of people who can't. Who can't go to God right now? Shut-ins? No, nope. they can pray, right? Who can't pray? 
Unbelievers. That's right. If you don't know Jesus, how do you get to God, right? Uh, and so you guys pray on behalf of people who don't know the Lord, and you go to God on their behalf. They don't know how to do that. And so then again, when you turn around and face them, what are you going to do? You're going to be the preachers and the teachers for them. So your neighbors, your classmates, uh, relatives, uh, people like that. Hang on a second. I'm going to zip outside real quick. I'll be right back. All right. Sorry about that. It was actually some people looking for a 12-step group, and we're, we're closed. I, I can't wait till we can open again. Okay, so you guys function as priests because you will be able to pray for those who don't know the Lord Jesus, and you can pray for them. And then in turn, you will teach them the gospel. And don't sell yourselves short on that because, uh, you know, some, oh, we have another dog now. Sorry. I'm not ADD. Me, not at all. Um, and so... I'm bringing my dog next time. That's all I can say. So you don't sell yourself short because you might think, well, you know, I'm not a pastor or whatever. But you guys move in different circles than we do. And, and in this postmodern world we live in, sometimes, sometimes people are uncomfortable around pastors. Um, but you guys, you're, you're regular people. And so you have the opportunity to share with them the hope you have in Christ in ways that Pastor Kyle and I cannot. So don't sell yourself short. All right. Back to our regularly scheduled slides. Uh, letter B, the Bible also makes a distinction between the priesthood of all believers and what's called the pastoral office instituted by God. And so all Christians are part of the royal priesthood, but not all Christians are pastors. And so we can, I'll, I'll click on Ephesians 4 here where it says it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. That's kind of obvious, right? If it's some, that means it's not all. And what's our job? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And so my job, Pastor Kyle's job, is to prepare you guys for works of service, wherever that may be. So uh, you guys are going to school, at least part-time, and so our job is to prepare you to be the best Christians you can and maybe share the hope of Christ with somebody who's really discouraged. Our job is to prepare people on the other end of the spectrum, maybe folks who are, like I visited, some shut-ins who they know they're near the end and they might die in a year or two or three. And, and our job is to prepare them uh, to, to die a Christian death so they can give a good witness and everything in between. <clears throat> Paul describes the pastor as an architect and the church as God's building. So there are different descriptions of pastors. The word pastor means shepherd, and that is by far the most common uh, metaphor or motif for pastors in the Bible. Uh, and, and so we're supposed to be shepherds leading the flock after our, our good shepherd, Jesus. But another one is architect. And so sometimes that means we have to kind of think and plan and, and do that sort of thing. And I'm going to skip that cartoon because I don't like it so much. Uh, number two, the pastor as shepherd, so that's what the word pastor means again, is accountable for the spiritual welfare of the church. So uh, I'm going to pop up the, the verse from Ezekiel here. And of course, this is Old Testament, but it, but it still has some application. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Ezekiel was a prophet. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, a wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. <laughs> so that's kind of sobering, isn't it? Um, but, but what it basically means is, I have to be honest with you. 
And there's times it would be way easier not to be honest with you. And you guys are great folks. I, I know all of you fairly well and thank the Lord. I don't have to worry about, you know, certain things or most things, most anything with you guys. But there are times I have to talk to people. And, and here's the most common example. Let's say someone has been a member of a congregation for a number of years, but for the last two months or three months, they just haven't worshiped at all. That's the time for a pastor to go over and, and say, hey, how's it going? I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> and of course, they know what I'm talking about. And that, that can be interesting at times. And of course, a more serious example maybe is when there is a, a big conflict and I need to go and talk with someone and say, look, when you said this at that meeting, there were three other people who were very offended. And there were some hurt feelings, there was some anger, and we need to get together and have some reconciliation happen. There, there needs to be honest acknowledgement of the sin and then forgiveness for that. And uh, much of the time that's heard well and that happens. Sometimes it doesn't go so well. So, And then when I preach and when Pastor Kyle preaches, we have to be honest about what the Bible says. We, we can't soft pedal stuff. We can't say, well, that's okay, you know, because it's not okay. It's forgiven. And every sin is forgivable in Christ, but it's not okay. And you guys know that, right? So uh, in our families, whether it's spouses or children, when we hurt each other, it's not okay, is it? It hurts, but it is forgivable. And that's such a blessing when Let's say I, I hurt my wife or my son, and I've done both plenty of times. Um, when I go to them and say, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I blew it. And, and then when they bring forgiveness to me, it actually makes the relationship stronger, doesn't it? And the same thing is true in the church. When, when there's honest acknowledgement, here's some sin, it's a problem, and there's forgiveness, it actually makes the church stronger. So uh, parents, <laughs> you want to know about Jesus? Uh, give the pastor a call. That's his job. We don't advocate this here at Light of the Hills. We encourage parents to talk to their, their children about that. But we are a resource for that. The congregation is also responsible for the physical and spiritual welfare of their pastor. And again, I'm not saying this to draw attention to me, but I'm just telling you what's in the Word. So if we look at the Word... Uh, in the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Uh, what does that help us do? When you guys make a budget and you guys generously give offerings and Pastor Kyle and I and our other staff are taken care of, what does that allow us to do? It allows us to not worry and stress about that. And we can go about visitation and preparing sermons and Bible classes. And we're focused on those things. And that's a huge blessing. And I can tell you over the years, talking with lots of other pastors, that doesn't always happen. And the stress level gets really high when a when uh, pastor goes home and there's not enough money to make ends meet. Uh, and, and so it's just such a blessing. And, and we're very grateful to Light of the Hills. And same thing with the verse there at the bottom, um, sharing all good things. Uh, same thing here. Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain. So sometimes I compare it to an ox. I, I, I can deal with that. Um, and here's one, uh, or no, it's the next one. Uh, this one says, we ask you brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. And, and we feel very blessed to be at Light of the Hills. We've got a great congregation that really gives us a great deal of joy. And, and that's this last verse here that, that really I want you to notice. It says, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. And we do have to give an account to God for how we lead you guys. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden. And the vast majority of time, our work here at Lighted Hills is a joy. And so thank you. Okay, what more do we learn about the church? The church is called by God to forgive sins and to retain sins. Uh, and so we get an example of this in John 20, verse 23, where Jesus gives that authority to his apostles. And he says, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And, and this is why pastors uh, in worship services will say things like, uh, uh, oh, how's it go? So as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. 
How? By his authority. So it's not that the pastor has some authority dwelling in me that makes me able to forgive sins. What it means is that if the scriptures give me authority to forgive sins, then I should forgive them. But if the scriptures do not give me that authority because the person says, I didn't do anything wrong, then I can't forgive that sin. Now, why does God do that? Why does God give pastors authority to do that? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. The reason God gives us that authority is so that people have a place they can go to. You've probably heard me say before that um, the baptismal font, the altar where the Lord's Supper is given, and the pulpit are grace places. And and where God gives his grace, we can point to that baptism and say, oh, thank you, Lord. Sins are forgiven. We can point to the Lord's Supper and say, oh, thank you, Lord. My sins are forgiven because Jesus says, eat and drink for the forgiveness of sins. And in the sermon, same thing. And and the same thing happens in individual confession. Lutherans practice confession for individuals like Roman Catholics do. We do it in a very different way, but we still have the practice. Now, why is that? So that a person can hear the words of forgiveness or absolution from the pastor and say, I know my sins are forgiven because according to the scriptures, Jesus says to his apostles, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. And when you have that blessing, it takes a thousand pounds off your shoulders, and, it, and it's a huge blessing. Throw questions at me if you got them. Okay. So why is it important for us? To, yeah, go ahead, Brian. So if I've sinned during the week, so I know we have the corporate uh, confession, forgiveness of sins on Sunday morning. But if I've sinned during the week, is that to say that I got to come to you? To say, hey, I've sinned and, and I need to hear those words of forgiveness, or can I dial direct and sit and go to God and say, hey, I recognize I blew it. Help me not do that again. Yeah, the good news is it's not either or, it's both and. Okay. And so uh, certainly we, in fact, Luther writes about confession. Let, I'll go through all this in, in a few minutes. So confession, he says, when you go to your pastor, you go, when something is still troubling you. So let's say you sin during the week and you're able to, to remember a, a verse in the Bible, like first John one, eight, nine, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive our sins. And you remember that and you go, yeah, Lord, I, I messed up. I'm sorry, but I know you forgive me because it says here, then fine. But I think all of us in life, or at least I can say for me, there are times when I've done something and I know that Bible verse but I still struggle with feelings of guilt or shame. And I hate that. And so I have a pastor um, that I've used for years and I will go to him and say, Hey, it's me. When can I come over and see you? And I'll go over and see him and I'll say, I did this. I know what it says in the Bible, but I'm still struggling with feelings of, of guilt and I just need to hear it. That's where individual confession comes in. Uh, confession comes in. In Roman Catholic confession, you're required to go at least once a year. Luther confession says, go whenever you need it. Roman Catholic confession says, you should list every sin you can think of. Luther confession says, whatever's bothering you, that's what you should confess. Roman Catholic confession is, um, it's, it's done in three steps. The first step is confession. And that's where you list and enumerate every sin you can think of. Step number two is called contrition. And that means uh, feelings of sorrow and guilt. And this is the part where you feel bad. Step number three in Roman Catholic confession is penance. And that is where you say a certain number of prayers, or maybe you go and do a certain number of um, good things, uh, or maybe you attend a mass, um, something to that effect. And that's Roman Catholic confession. Now, the Lutherans came in and they said, we look at the Bible and like that verse that we just saw, they say, we look at the Bible and it says that, yeah, your pastor can forgive sin. So we're going to retain confession, but we're going to change the way we do it. There's only two parts. Number one is you confess your sin, whatever's bothering you and nothing more. You don't need to enumerate everything, whatever's bothering you. And step number two, absolution or forgiveness. Now, when Luther writes about this, he says, 
of the two parts, the confessing and the and the absolving or the confessing and the forgiving, the most important part is the forgiving. And so you see how it's very different. It's not about listing every sin I've committed, feeling lousy about it, and then going out and doing something to hopefully make myself feel better or to kind of even the scale. No, it's about here's what I've done, Lord, and I know you died for me, but I just I feel bad. And then someone speaks into my ears, someone who has authority, they have a call from God to speak those words of forgiveness into my ears and say, hey, listen, Jesus is talking to you. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. That's the difference. And it's a very powerful and good gift. Okay, any questions? No, that's great. Thank you. All right, good. Ella, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, yes. That poor girl needs some caffeine. She does. All right. I'm, I'm just like you. I, I actually went home and I took a, about a 30 minute nap before dinner today because I was so tired. It's fun getting old. Okay. Letter A. Sin is real, not relative. And this is why we take it seriously. Sin can really hurt. Now, when someone does something uh, and they sin and it's not a big deal, what do we say? Oh, it's okay. But what about when someone really hurts your feelings, when they say or do something that really hurts? Then we realize, man, this is bad. It hurts. Uh, and, and so that's why the church has to be open and honest about this stuff. Fun little cartoon here. What's wrong with me? Am I neurotic? Am I suffering from a guilt complex or something? Well, you are guilty. And in, our, in our world today, so often we try to explain away guilt. It's much better just to forgive it. Then we're done with it. Right? All right, number one, sin separates. We see this in the book of Genesis. We did that in our very first unit. Uh, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what did they do? Do you guys remember? They hid. They hid, that's right. They hid from God. And then when God came to Adam and said, hey, did you eat of the fruit you're not supposed to? What did Adam do? He blamed his wife. Yes, he did. So what does sin do? Sin <laughs> separates, right? And what else do we learn? Sin escalates. I don't have time to read you the story tonight, but read 2 Samuel 11. And you'll read about King David who, who lusts after a woman. Then he gets her to come to the palace and sleeps with her, so he commits adultery. When she gets pregnant, he tries to hide, hide it. And when that doesn't work, he kills her husband. Sin escalates. It's a powerful and disturbing story. So to, to deal with all that stuff, God says, no, church, you be honest about sin, not to make people feel bad, but to bring forgiveness. And so God gave to his church the ministry of reconciliation. I'll, I'll pop 2 Corinthians 5 on the screen. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, although as though God were making his appeal through us. And God is making his appeal through us. All right, so, yeah, here, now look what you got us into. That's what Adam did to his wife, and she gave him the glare. But in Christ, what can happen? Reconciliation, where two parties that are separated can be brought together. And again, you've probably experienced this in your family. When, there, when there's a sin, we don't usually call it that, but that's what it is. We're divided. But when we forgive each other, then, then we're brought back together. The astounding truth of the gospel is that Christ has already won forgiveness for all sins, for all time. We just read that verse, right? God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus paid for every sin. And so heaven really is open to everyone. All they need now, then, is for the church to do its job, which is to urge everyone in the world to repent, receive that forgiveness, and be reconciled to God. So heaven is open to everyone, and all you have to do is receive the gift of faith in Christ. It's free. Here it is. And that's our job. And because of that, then, forgiveness is to be the lifestyle of a Christian. Think of what we say in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That's easy to say on Sunday, but it gets harder during the week, doesn't it? 
So you don't want to be like this guy, right? Well, forgive me, but you started it. And that's, that's not really the way to do it in, in the Christian life. Sometimes Christians must confront each other over sinful behavior. And that's what we got to do. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, they didn't put the verse here for us. So, so let's turn to Matthew 18. And I want to talk to you briefly about what we do as a congregation when we deal with sin. Thankfully, it's rare. And uh, we don't have to do it very often. But we want you to know what we do as a congregation when something um, happens. So Matthew 18, we'll start at verse 15. I can't tell you a page number. So you're on your own. Matthew 18, and uh, we're going to start at verse 15. So Matthew's first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother, and we could say if your brother or sister sins against you, go post it on Instagram. Isn't that what it says? Wait, no, it doesn't say that, does it? If your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So if someone sins against me, my job is not to quit, call my wife and say, Someone hurt my feelings and I feel sad. No, my job is to go to that individual and say, look, here's what happened. And you may not be aware of this, but um, I need to talk to you about that. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Who is Jesus concerned about in that verse? If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. He's not worried about you and me, is he? He's worried about the person who sinned against you. That's the exact opposite of how we feel, isn't it? When someone sins against me, I'm worried about me. And Jesus says, no, you should be worried about that person who sinned against you because their spiritual life is damaged, and you need to be concerned about them. Now, I want to encourage you guys in this because I will tell you that 99.7% of the time, if you go to someone with a loving spirit, you pray before you go, and you say, okay, uh, Ruth or, or Brian, I, you know, here's what happened when we were in that class, and you said this to me. And you're probably not aware of it, but you know what? That really hurt me. And I know you, and I'm sure you didn't mean that, but I wanted to talk to you about it. 99.7% of the time, what are people going to say? They're going to say, oh, I am so sorry. I had no idea. So don't let you know this be too fearful for you guys. Take the risk. Approach the person in humility and with prayer ahead of time and talk to them. And if you you want me to, I'll pray for you. You know, Give me a call and say, I got to go talk to so-and-so. I want you to pray. I will pray for you. Now, if that doesn't work, next verse. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So again, if I'm in this class and you know Brian said something, I might ask one or two of you to, to back me up and say, yeah, we heard this. Okay, th this is what happened. Now, if he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, that last verse might say like might sound like Jesus is saying, kick him out of the church. But, but let me ask you a question. How does Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? Do you guys remember what Matthew's job description was before Jesus called him to be a disciple? That's right. He was a tax collector. Oh, good. We got another member of the class. This is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so Jesus called Matthew a tax collector to be his disciple. So how did Jesus treat people who were considered bad sinners? He evangelized them. He witnessed to them. He loved them. And, and so if, if we have an issue with someone in the church, step one is I go talk to that person. Step two is I take one or two others along with me who are witnesses to that. And if nobody witnessed it, then you might take a, a, a fellow Christian along who's very mature, very calm, and who will be just a very uh, patient listener. And then, again, if, if that doesn't work, that's when you might come and talk to me or your elder. Uh, families in the church are assigned elders, and we'll go from there. Now, by far, the most common issue we deal with here is simply people disappearing from church. And so uh, what we try to do, let, let's say... Um, the Smith family, whoever that is, or the Jones family, they're just not coming to church, and we'll try to contact them. And if that doesn't work, then we'll send a letter saying, hey, you know, we haven't seen you in church for four or six months or a year, 
and uh, we'd like to see you. And if that doesn't get a response, we send a second letter. And by the way, this is all done through our board of elders. So this is not just one individual. This is a group of, of mature Christians saying, we think we need to take action here. And we'll continue to try and make phone calls and try to listen. And if finally, if we get no response and we've tried for months and months, then we'll send them a letter that says, by your actions, you are showing that you don't want to be a member of the church. And unless we hear from you, that's the action we'll take. So that's by far the most common action that we'll take uh, in these kind of situations. But that's how the church works it. Any questions about that? No, no. God bring the caffeine. Okay. Uh, Roman numeral six. God has promised to preserve his church until Christ returns. Okay, I have this really cool video next that talks about the different kinds of um, uh, uh, or the different ways of looking at a church. I'm going to share computer sound. I'll play the video. It's about a two-minute video, and then you can tell me whether or not the audio worked, okay? So here we go. All right, so did the audio come through? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. That's a great video, isn't it? Because it really makes us think about why am I part of a congregation? Why do I worship? Is it about just kind of having fun and being entertained? Or is it really about this mission that Jesus calls his church on to share the gospel with the world? And, and so to me, that's one of my favorite videos. Okay, any questions from this unit before we close? And we got about a half hour left. We'll start our next unit and uh, kind of go from there. Any questions about the church or the pastoral office or anything like that? The other analogy I've heard, the, I've heard the cruise ship battleship one. I've also heard the cruise ship aircraft carrier where the aircraft carriers, you come in and you get fueled up on Sundays to fly your missions during the week. Oh, I like that. Yeah, it's nice. Forgive, forgiving others um, also sometimes means, you know, you can forgive other people, but sometimes those relationships won't remain. Yeah, that's a great point, Sue. And, and one thing I like to differentiate uh, with these kind of conflicts is the difference between forgiveness and consequences. And uh, you can see this in, in the Bible. Um, for example, remember I shared with you how David did the, all these terrible things, adultery, uh, murder, and so on, and he covered it all up. Well, he was confronted by a prophet named Nathan. God sent Nathan uh, to, to David to confront him. And he tells him this kind of a parable, and David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And the prophet says, um, you will not die in your sins. The Lord has put away your sin. But there were consequences. And the, the prophet went on to, and they were serious consequences. Um, the child that was born to David and the woman, her name was Bathsheba, the child died. And, and David said that you did this in secret, but one of your sons will do the kind of a similar thing to you in public. And he did. Uh, the sin of David became known, right? It was written about in the Bible. And so he suffered serious consequences. But was he forgiven? Yes. And the same thing can happen in relationships where um, someone might hurt me or you, and we might forgive that person, but there are still consequences. And, and a very common application of this, and I've had many um, individuals come to me over the years and say, I'm having a problem with an adult parent. The adult parent, you know, I'm in my 30s or my 40s, and my adult parent is still trying to control me. They say terrible things about me to other relatives. They try to manipulate me with guilt. It's, it's so painful for me. Uh, and, and so we work on, yes, you can forgive your parent. And this can be a child as well, of course. In fact, I, I know of an, a parent, an older parent who's a retired person who's, whose child is treating them in the same way. You can forgive that person, but there are still consequences. For example, we can forgive, but maybe I'm not going to ever spend time in your house again. That's not a sin to say, I, I can't go there because I get trapped and I get accused of things. That's not a sin. Um, it, it's a consequence of, of the sin that happened. Uh, for example, the guy that David killed was a man named Uriah. 
And I'm sure one of the consequences for David was he didn't hang out with Uriah's brothers, probably, right? You know, that would be very obvious. And so there, there can be forgiveness while there still are consequences. And by the way, a very helpful book for this. If you have relatives, it typically is what it is, parents or children. It's a very well-known book. It's called Boundaries. It's written by two Christian counselors. Their last names are Temp and Cloud. And uh, we have a copy in the library. Uh, if it's not checked out, you can borrow it. And in this book, Boundaries, it, it teaches you how to have healthy boundaries so people can't run over you all the time. And so we can forgive, but still have consequences, still have healthy boundaries. It's a great book. And there's, there's boundaries uh, for parents, boundaries in marriage, boundaries for teens. I mean, they got a whole series of them because they're really helpful books. Great question, Sue. Any other thoughts before we move on? Okay. I then am going to... Oh, lost my screen. No wonder. Let me open our next. <clears throat> so we'll start unit seven. All right, here we go. Now let me get my screen sharing going. Share screen, PowerPoint show. All right, are we good? Yep. All right, and let's see, make sure we're still recording. We're still recording. All right. So we just got done talking about um, the church and how God gives grace. And now we're going to see specifically how he does this. And these are some of the most um, often questioned teachings of the Bible that I get. Not questioned in the sense that are they real or not, but just, you know, how do we do this and what does it mean and so on. So uh, some really good stuff. And so means of grace. We're going to talk about baptism. And we were so thrilled to, to do three baptisms in the Hewer family. Oh boy, when was that? April? Was that May? It seems like a two years ago. When was that? It was in June. Is in June? No way. <laughs> All right. But anyways, that was just one of the highlights of my year was those baptisms to see that done. So we'll talk about baptism tonight. Uh, and that's probably where we'll quit. And then we'll get Lord's Supper um, next time. Okay. So without the grace of God, we're lost, right? We're stuck. We're dead. We're not going to make it. You guys are you guys are pretty familiar with that. So I'm going to assume you have that one written in. We're going to the next one. So here's, this is what I look like when I go to the gym, kind of, okay? And so how fit for life are we spiritually? Well, if you look at the weights on the, on the barbell, age, ego, pride, sickness, self, greed, we're, we're not doing very good. We can't carry all this stuff. So we need God's grace. And the Bible actually teaches us that we are spiritually blind without Jesus. I'm going to pop up each one of these verses because to me, they're just, they're so important. So 2 Corinthians 4, uh, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So if you don't have faith in Christ, you can't see him. You, you just, you just don't, it doesn't make any sense right? So we're spiritually blind. Next one, we are spiritually dead. Uh, 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has life. He who ha does not have the Son of God does not have life. Well, if you don't have life, what are you? You're dead. And we are by nature enemies of God. That certainly is not the, the typical thought of, of our uh, culture today. Because our culture says people are basically good. But what does the Bible say? Romans 5.10. For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So what are we apart from Christ? We are God's enemies. And so spiritually, we're blind, we're dead, and we're enemies of God without faith in Christ. Is that clear enough for you all? 
right? I mean, that's, that makes it about as abundantly clear as possible. So we need help. We need God's grace. And the good news is God gives us his grace through what we call means. So what does the word means mean? Means are like vehicles or ways. So what are the ways? What are the means? What are the vehicles by which God gives us his grace? Notice how much fitter this guy is. This is like Brian Mackin. This is how you look when you work out, right? Yeah. Right? So uh, here's this big tank of God's grace. He's got all this grace he wants to give to us. How does he give it to us? First of all, he does it through his word. Um, and I don't know. Let's see. What, what page are you guys are on? I'll look it up here in the book. 51. 51. Okay. I want to see what you guys have for illustrations. Okay. So um, there's some stuff coming that will flesh this out a little bit. Okay. So number one is God's word. Number two is baptism. And number three is the Lord's Supper. And so if this, you can imagine grace is this big tank, it kind of is drawn like a tank. And you have all these little pipelines, right? That grace is going to come out through these pipelines. And so um, as we go on then, everybody got them written in? We're going to move in. All right. So the word is a means of grace. Jesus stands behind the power of the word to forgive. He says in Luke 24, 47, that uh, the whole Bible is about me. Now, here's the one I really want you to see. The word of God creates faith. It actually does. And so Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Faith comes from hearing the message. So the word of God creates faith. So it is a means of grace. It is a vehicle of grace. It is one of the ways grace gets to us. And the word of God brings salvation. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. All right, number or letter B. Baptism is a means of grace. It is a birth from above. <laughs> your dog's hilarious. His face is right next to yours, and it looks like he's right next to you, Brian. It's hilarious. He, he literally is about two inches. It's a good thing his breath doesn't stink yet. Yeah, it is a good thing. <laughs> All right, so uh, in John 3, look at what Jesus says. Um, at the very bottom, he says, in reply, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And in John 3, verse 5, uh, he says, you have to be born of water and the spirit. So it is a birth. None of us chose to be born. And so baptism is a way of God getting his grace to us. Number two, it is commanded by our Lord Jesus. He says in Matthew 28, go, uh, verse 19, I'm looking at, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey. And it really should be translated, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And so how does, how does a disciple get made by being baptized and by being taught? In baptism, God's word of forgiveness becomes a visible word. Right? We can see it. God's word is the power behind a baptism. It's not the water. It's not the pastor. It's not the person. It's God's word. But look what, look what Peter says in 1 Peter 3.21. He's talking about the water of the flood of Noah's day. This water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, I, have, I have people from other denominations who say baptism doesn't save you. All I do is I point them to 1 Peter 3.21. What does the Bible say? The Bible says baptism saves you. I don't know how you argue with that. The blessings of baptism are given to all who believe. Mark 16, 16 says that. Now, why is that important? Because one of the reasons that people in some denominations will say baptism doesn't save you is uh, they see people who never go to church. Uh, let's say I have six kids and my wife and I never go to church, but we got them all baptized, uh, you know, because grandpa and grandma pushed, pushed us and forced us to do it. So we baptized them all one day. And then they never went to church for the rest of their lives. 
And so people see that and they say, well, baptism doesn't save because I see those people and, and they're, not, they're not acting like Christians. They never worship. Well, that's a great point. But the problem there is not with baptism. It's not with the gift. The problem is with lack of faith. Remember, Jesus says in Matthew 28, make disciples how? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. And so baptism isn't some magic formula. It's a new birth. And I think I've got a cartoon. I'm way, yeah, I'm way ahead of myself. So I'll get to the cartoon in a minute. All right. So letter A, our sins are washed away. You can read, I, you know, I'd love to read all the Bible verses, but we don't have time. And if, we went through, if you went through the book of Acts, you can go back and look it up. Letter B, we receive the Holy Spirit. That's in Acts chapter 2. And a verse I mentioned yesterday in a sermon, we are clothed with Christ. So tons of blessings in baptism. By the way, note that God's the one doing the action, not me, not you. God's the one doing the action. And there's a, this great uh, this great picture here. I love it. You, you can see the man, and look how dirty his clothes are underneath. It's a little hard to see on a computer screen, but his clothes are all dirty and gray. And what, what is Jesus putting on him? He's clothing him with his own righteousness, symbolized by the white robe. <laughs> Your dog is hilarious. Letter D, we are adopted into God's family. Number five, the church administers baptism through called pastors for the sake of order in the church. In emergencies, any Christian can and should baptize. Now, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but I'm curious if any of you own one of our hymnals that we have in you can buy them. They're at church. Anybody own a hymnal? Sue maybe does. She thinks maybe she has one. I have an old one, like way old. Okay, well, I got those too. But I want to encourage you guys, uh, and of course, don't buy it if you're tight on money, but I want to encourage you to, to buy one of these. There's a number of reasons for that. Now, one of them is when you go into the back of the book, it's like you can see I've got like two pages before the back of the book. It says, holy baptism in case of emergency, right? And so if you have one of these in your home, maybe there's an accident outside your church or outside your home. Or maybe your neighbor comes over and has cancer and, and says, you know, Ruth or, or Lars, your neighbors are like a million miles away, but just go with me, okay? Actually, you have neighbors like 100 feet away, don't you? So this could happen. And maybe you have to do it in Spanish. So pay attention, okay? So uh, anyways, you might have to get your hymnal, and, and it just has a very simple form of baptism right here and shows you exactly what to do, and that's it. Now, the other reason to have a hymnal, um, I didn't plan on doing this, but I'll do it anyway. Um, we're, we're in a weird place. We can't come to church as often as we'd like, um, and, and it's very frustrating because, because of that. So there are, and this shows you that I didn't, I didn't plan this. There is something called daily prayer for families and individuals. You can do that. Um, there is, and this, they have prayers for morning, noon, and evening. There's a daily lectionary. Lectionary is a fancy word for reading through the Bible. There's prayers in here. There's different orders of service that you can do. And there's all these hymns. Now, some of them, I get it. They're old and they're hard to sing. I get it. But there's some that you'll know. Go, oh, I know that one. And when you can't sing together with people in church, singing is a thing that lifts our spirit. I tell you, uh, I don't know how you guys are doing, but sometimes I get depressed because of this COVID garbage. I hate having this be shut down. I hate that I can't see you guys on Sunday mornings very, very well. Um, but if I sing with my family at home, and yes, I make my son sing, and he, he's okay with it. Um, it's really encouraging. It lifts your spirits. And by the way, you can also go on YouTube and um, we love the Keith and Kristen Getty hymns and you can get those and you can print the words out and you can sing them and you turn the, 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 like the sound bar up really loud and then you can't hear yourself. That works really well. By the way, you guys probably don't know this, but Sue Mackin is our, uh, our weekly e-newsletter editor. And we don't always remember to do this, but uh, Pastor Kyle and I try to get the music for Sunday to her by the Wednesday e-newsletter with links uh, for the song so you can practice before you come. 
Okay, so you can and should baptize in, 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 in when there's an emergency. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life, but anyone who believes in him will, will obey his command and seek to be baptized. And so this little, um, this little number six here is all about, can a person be saved without baptism? And the answer is yes. How do we know that? Well, when Jesus is on the cross, he's got uh, two thieves, one on each side, and they both revile him early on. But one of them hears the word of God. Remember, it's the word of God that creates faith. He hears Jesus speaking. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, "Today, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, is Jesus able to baptize him? Nope. Uh, John the apostle is at the foot of the cross. Does he baptize him? Nope. The guy dies. The poor guy gets his legs broken after Jesus dies. But he's with Jesus even now. What a great miracle that is. And so it's the word of God that creates faith and brings people into eternal life. But the word of God that that thief heard in his ear is the same word of gospel that's heard in a baptism. And so, again, anyone who believes in him will seek to be baptized. And again, back in June, we had a great uh, day where we had three baptisms right in the front of the church. That was awesome. Okay, now let's talk about infant baptism. Infant baptism actually was the accepted practice of the early church. So I don't know if you have friends in other church denominations, but they, they'll say things like, no, 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 um, the child has to be old enough to decide if he or she wants to be baptized. Or um, uh, if a child, uh, they don't need to be baptized because they're not yet at the age of accountability, which typically is around 12 or something like that. There's nothing in the Bible about an age of accountability. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 51 verse 5, Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. So when egg and sperm come together, what do you got there? Well, biologically, what do you say? I call it a zygote or something like that. You know, and then you have an embryo. But, but theologically, when an egg and a sperm come together, what do you have? You have a, a little sinner. That's what you have, right? And so a child is conceived and born in sin. So here's a quote from uh, one of the early church fathers, a guy named Origen. And he said, the church received from the apostles the tradition, the practice of baptizing infants. And another guy named Hippolytus, and you can see when he lived a little bit later, first you should baptize the little ones. All who can speak for themselves should speak. So probably three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old. But for those who cannot speak, their parents should speak for them or another who belongs to their family. This is the ancient church talking. They were just a few generations away from the apostles. They practiced infant baptism. Here we have a photo. And that photo, uh, I don't have my notes in front of me. I believe it's around 310. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick here. Okay, 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 okay. Almost there, almost there, almost there. Here we go. Uh, approximately 300 AD from North Africa. Uh, and so that baptismal font's way too small for an adult to go in, isn't it? And so there's a church that practiced uh, infant baptism. And so the practice of the ancient church, and certainly the teaching of the ancient church and the Bible, is that baptism was something that was done for infants. So let's look at some biblical teaching here. In New Testament, in the New Testament, baptism is directly connected to the Old Testament covenant of circumcision. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you know that uh, a baby boy was circumcised on the eighth day of his life. So he was born, and eight days later, that little boy was circumcised. And circumcision was the way you entered into the people of God in the Old Testament. Let's look at Colossians 2. Paul writes, In him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. There's so much in this. I could preach an hour-long sermon right now, but that would be way too long for all you sleepy people, so I'm not going to do it. But look what's in that text, right? So it's a new circumcision, not done by people, but done by Christ. What does that mean? Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him 
through your faith in the power of God. So Jesus is the one doing the action in baptism. He's giving you a spiritual circumcision. And notice what verse 13 says. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive. What does that do to someone saying, well, you have to decide that you're ready to believe. You have to invite Christ into your heart. It doesn't work. You're dead. And in baptism, Jesus comes and he makes you alive. And he forgives you all your sins. Now, I get jacked up about this, not because I'm trying to put down other churches, but simply to show the, the wonder and the power and the, the magnificence of this gift of baptism. You can take your baptism and say, I was baptized. My sins were forgiven. My heart was circumcised. I'm, I was dead, but now I'm alive. I mean, that's a miracle. It's fantastic. And we should be excited about that. And so if, if circumcision was done on the eighth day, that's why in the ancient church, they didn't blink an eye at baptizing infants, of course. You know, that little boy, that little Hebrew boy on the eighth day didn't say, I want to be a Hebrew. He didn't say that. He was eight days old. He didn't say anything. He, oh, he cried. I'm sure he cried when he was circumcised. Um, but in the same way, the, the New Testament church said, well, of course, it's something done by God. Why, why would we wait till they're 12? Why would we do that? Uh, in the New Testament, we also read that it was the practice of the apostles to baptize whole households. So, uh, again, we did the book of Acts. And remember, Paul and Silas are in jail, and uh, they're singing and, and praying at midnight, and the, there's an earthquake, and the jail is open. You remember that when we went through Acts? And in verse 33, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. And there's a couple other examples there you can look up on your own. Arguments against infant baptism do not stand up to what the Bible actually says. For example, Jesus says little ones can believe in him. And what's interesting about that is the, the Greek word that's used there for little ones, uh, it's a Greek word called, it's pronounced brephos. That same word is used of John the Baptist when he's in the womb of his mother Elizabeth. And that's an unborn child. And Jesus says, yeah, little ones like that can believe. And by the way, think about this. What's another word for, for faith? Trust, right? So if I have faith in Christ, I trust in Christ. Think about it this way. So some of you guys are moms. And uh, when you your baby grew inside you for about nine months. And when your baby was born, it's amazing how they trust mommy, don't they? Right away. Now, why is that? Because for nine months, they've heard mommy's heartbeat. They've heard mommy's voice. It kind of sounds like this, but they've heard mommy's voice. <laughs> they've heard dad's voice, which is even farther away. Right? But, they, you know, dad kind of sounds like, rrr, rrr. what's that, right? And, and that never changes, does it? <sighs> so they, they, they trust mom. And what happens when grandma comes for the first time? <gasps> Give me my grandbaby. I want to hold my grandbaby. And they take the child. And what does the child do often? She cries because she doesn't know grandmama. Now, in just a few years, grandmama is going to be the best because she'll give her what mom and dad won't give her. So grandma's going to be awesome. But at that moment in her life, that little baby doesn't trust grandma because she doesn't know her. What does that tell us about babies? They can trust. Now, if a baby can trust mom and maybe even dad, who are just simply human beings, can God create trust? In the heart and life of a little child? Of course he can. So why would we say infants can't believe? It's not biblical. Now, can babies sin? Yes, they can. Sin is not just a doing problem, but a being problem. So let's say you have a three-month-old in your house. You've just had a baby. It's all very exciting. Can that baby go rob a bank? Nope. But can that child grow up and learn how to rob a bank? Absolutely. And so sin comes from inside, not from the outside. Our world says people are basically good, and children grow up, and they get disillusioned, and bad things happen to them, and that's why they sin. Well, that's nice, but it just isn't true. Right? How many of us taught our children to say, I hate you? Did we ever say that around our kids? No, we were very careful never to say that. In fact, we worked for months to teach our children, maybe years, to teach our children to say, when grandma comes 
and she gives you your birthday present, please, please, please just say thank you. I mean, we work for months on this. And when they finally do it, we say, yes, Jesus, you can come now. I'm a successful parent. But do we do we have to teach them to say, that's mine? Nope. I, I have a bunch of nephews and nieces, so they will remain anonymous. But when when one of my nephews was about two, two and a half, maybe, he had a little baby brother. And 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 we used to live near near the this family. We were and still are really good friends with them. And and so we came over, and here's the little boy, the tiny little infant. And they set him on the couch, you know, and he can't, he can't even hold his head up. He's on the couch like this. And they put him next to his two and a, two and a half year old brother. And, and of course, who are we paying attention to? The little one. And so the older brother just takes his hand. He just, he just sticks out and he goes, Froom! and he pushes the little guy, the poor little guy. And he goes down onto the sofa, right? He was angry because he was jealous. D did his parents teach him that? No. It's right in here. And we all know that because we know ourselves. And so our baby sinners, yes, they are. And they, so they need God's grace. I'm going to skip the cartoon there. So that's why we baptize children. And the Bible, again, what does it say? The Bible says that the blessings of baptism are there for you and your children. Acts 2.38. Uh, Peter is asked by people who have heard him preach this sermon, what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so it's not just for adults. Now, people some, sometimes look at this word repent and they say, oh, but you have to repent. Yes, you do. And what is repentance? It is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit creates repentance and faith in us. Repentance is a gift of the Holy Spirit even as uh, faith is. By the way, we're commanded to baptize all nations. It doesn't say all nations except children. It says baptize all nations. Number nine. But again, baptism is not a magic formula. I mentioned that before. That's why Jesus says, make disciples, baptizing and teaching. And so there's no excuse for any of us to be baptized or to baptize our children or see our grandchildren baptized and then say, we're done. Now they don't, have to, they don't have to be taught. And here's the cartoon I alluded to, gosh, 20 minutes ago. I love this cartoon. Stop. Don't feed that baby. Wait till he can decide for himself what he wants to eat. We would never do that. That, that would be neglectful, abusive parenting. We'd get arrested if we did that. You know, the old joke is you, you bring your child home from the hospital, and then you put them in a closet till they're 18, Right. Uh, it doesn't work in real life, nor does it work in the spiritual world. And so when our children are baptized, that's the new birth of water in the spirit. And then we feed them. And over the years, I've had parents tell me, well, I want to wait till my son is old enough and he can decide. And I just, I do my best to talk people out of it because it's just, it's a bad idea. Okay, I'm looking at the next slide that's coming and it deals with the Lord's Supper. So we'll talk about that next time. We'll stop here, but I want to see if there's any questions or thoughts about baptism, um, the means of grace, anything like that before we call it a night. I, I have one question. So a person that was formally baptized as a child, but then has fallen away, um, would they be considered the lost sheep that Jesus is going after? Is he going after those that were his, but then have fallen away and are at risk for being lost forever? <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Here for me is what I think is a really good analogy. Um, our kids are adopted. And, and so they weren't part of our family biologically, but they were made part of our family through adoption. And so we had to sign some papers and they became part of our family. Legally, they are our children, no matter what. And, and if God had blessed us with biological children, they would have the exact same legal rights as children born biologically. There's no difference. And, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a pledge that we made to our kids that we're going to be your parents no matter what. 
Now, biological parents do that too, but but the, the adoption thing is really nice because in the Bible, baptism is described also as adoption. And so what God does is he says, you're my child. He doesn't sign papers. He does his baptismal thing. And a person is brought into the family of God. Now, in our culture, in our society today, is it possible for children to divorce their parents? Yes, it is. They can actually go to court and say, I don't want them as my parents legally. I want nothing to do with them. I don't want to be part of that family anymore. And a judge, you can, can get a, uh, approve that and you can have the paperwork done. Now, would that change the way we would feel about our kids? Don't get any ideas, you guys. I saw that. Would, would, that, would that change uh, what we feel as parents if, our, if any of our kids did that? Of course not. We would always be there with open arms. Any of you guys would do that. And that's how God is with baptism. He always keeps his pledge, his promise. So if a person walks away from God, he's going to keep after them. He's going to send messengers. And if, by God's grace, someone speaks the word to them and they're brought back to faith, they don't need to be baptized again. They don't need to be readopted because God has always said, you're always going to be my child. And so that's how that works. Other thoughts or comments or... Um, questions? No? Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Let's close in prayer, and uh, we'll call it an evening. Lord God, thank you so much for these people. Thank you for your word and for your gifts of grace that save us, strengthen us, and lead us into eternal life. Amen.